So I'll tell you what what's up there. So I think I know all you. I'm Margaret Farrow, Chair of English, and this is Dr. Alvarez Alvarez. Hello. Minister of English, and this is Dr. Marilyn Wendell. I think you know all of us, and you just met Edward. You all know Kirsten. So thanks for showing up um, to learn a little bit about what it's like to be a teacher in the Rose Valley. Strange times to be a teacher anywhere, right? Um, we have five panelists tonight. One of them is currently sitting here, <laughs> and the other three of the others are stuck by the side of the road or were. Um, they're on their way, they're getting their tire fixed, and they were excited to come and they just called and said, oh, we still really want to be there, so if you can wait till five o'clock, we'll be there. Hopefully, they will show up. Um, shall I just... Yeah, go uh, for it. A quick reminder that if you are thinking about the MAT program, the application deadline is January 7th this year. We don't have flyers yet, but we should be posting those. Um, so our panelist that we are really honored is here is Kevin Boringlot. Hello. He is a former English major and MAT um, graduate and a current teacher at South Medford High School and a current MAT student in the MAT program and has taught overseas in Korea. So Kevin is the perfect person to be sitting in this chair. <laughs> he embodies all of these things. And what we asked um, our panelists to do was just talk a little bit about where they are today, what they're doing, what their professional route has been to get where they are, and you know maybe some of the things that make them passionate and excited about what they're doing, but short, and then we'll let people ask questions. So how about if I sit in one of these chairs too, so you don't feel so alone? That'll make you more comfortable. <laughs> 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 so thanks, Kevin. And if you just want to share your journey, that would be good. Okay. Well, I guess if we're talking about a journey, I'll start from the very beginning. <laughs> so um, I was actually born in the Philippines, and then I moved here when I was in fifth grade elementary school. And then I lived here in the Valley ever since. I grew up in Medford, and I went through school there, elementary, middle, high school. I went to school at South Medford High School. And then after high school, I took a year off from college just to kind of, I mean, before going to college, I took a year off just to kind of gauge the job market and see what I wanted to do in life. And then I realized that I want to go back to school. So I enrolled to RCC. I spent my first two years of uh, college there, my undergrad. And then I transferred here to SOU. I uh, majored in English, um, as Margaret mentioned. And um, yeah, and then after that, um, when I graduated my undergrad, I actually had uh, Dr. Alvarez and Dr. Perro here, so they're my former professors. I really enjoyed their classes, and um, I was really inspired during high school to actually pursue education, so I kind of started there. Um, my, I remember my AP Lit teacher, she really was uh, very inspiring. She just really encouraged me a lot and helped me a lot with my education. And I did a volunteer service during my senior year of high school where I worked with um, elementary kids um, during an after school program. And that kind of got me into assisting kids, working with kids. And then I just developed my passion there onwards. And then, uh, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around. <laughs> but, um, so fast forward back to SOU. Uh, when I graduated, um, I decided to go to South Korea for about two and a half years. So I worked there, I taught elementary, middle, high school um, at a public school system there. Um, but I was kind of working at like three different schools because my town that I lived at was quite small. So I was kind of just jumping around different schools um, every day. So like one day I'd be working at an elementary school, the next day I'd be at the middle school. But it was nice because I actually got to experience different grade levels and I kind of got an understanding of which particular age group I wanted to work with the most. Um, and so yeah. Um, after that, I went back here, I came back to Medford, and then I decided to enroll in the MAT program to get my uh, teaching license. And I'm in year two at the moment, I decided to go with a two-year program because I thought it would be nice to work during my first year in the program, just so I can get some money, <laughs> because you know, money is really important. <laughs> so, yeah. And now I'm in year two, I was actually student teaching during the beginning of this year, but then um, I heard about an opportunity at South Medford High School um, that Dr. Pearl kindly brought up for me. <laughs> and so I decided to apply for that and I got in and now I'm working at South Medford High School as an English teacher. So it's like back full circle to where I graduated <laughs> from. Um, and I'm also still in the MAT program finishing up. Uh, and yeah, so that's kind of where I am at. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, I wanted to ask, so uh, I've heard about like teaching in foreign countries and mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily need to speak the language. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, kind of broadly speaking, like what kind of difficulties did you face? You know, like, I don't know if you spoke the language or not, but you know, how did it go for you kind of thing? So coming into South Korea, I had like a very elementary understanding of Korean just because um, actually here at SOU, I used to be a writing tutor and I worked Quite ex uh, I worked a lot with some South Korean exchange students that uh, came here and so I actually made friends with some of them and then they would teach me Korean when I would teach them English so it was quite an interesting experience so when I went to Korea I had like very basic not enough to like converse or anything but I understood certain words but when I got there I actually did take it upon myself to learn the language so I enrolled in like classes to learn Korean it was it's still totally different from English but the experience actually made me understand English better. And I think it's the case with any foreign language. If you learn a foreign language, you really understand English better. So, yeah. But it is totally possible to work, you know, in countries where you don't speak the language, as long as you can, um, you know, teach in English. That's kind of what they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Is it really hard doing, like, how much work is it to be a teacher right now and doing the MIT? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll just leave for this part. <laughs> uh, a lot of work. I'm always tired. <laughs> it's like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, all right, I gotta go to work. <laughs> and then I gotta go to SU. <laughs> so um, it's a lot of work for sure and balancing it all. But I feel like my experience, I'm, I'm learning a lot more doing this than I would if I were student teaching. And don't get me wrong, like student teaching is awesome, but I think like being in front of the classroom by yourself and planning everything yourself really just, you know, makes you get the experience and all that so that you're better prepared afterwards, I would say, yeah. How did you decide which age you wanna work with? Okay, interesting. So <laughs> for me, I think each age group has their like pros and cons. I love working with all age groups, to be honest. Like, I remember like elementary kids are super sweet and funny and adorable, and they're always high energy. And then middle school kids are like in the middle, you know, they can be sweet, they can be spunky, and they, they have their own unique kind of like attributes that make you gravitate towards them too. And then with high schoolers, you really get to like converse with them more and talk about deeper topics. And so I, I appreciate that about them. Um, so for me, uh, I decided I liked high school the best because I could have those deeper conversations, as I mentioned, and I think we could explore the subject material more. So, like, we, yeah, so that's kind of how I ended up liking high school. So you're teaching right now just with your bachelor's in English while um, you're working yes. for a master's? Mm -hmm. Okay, and is that usual to be able to do that? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe in the past it's not as typical, but, you know, during at, in this climate right now with, you know, the shortage of teachers and all that, um, I guess it's quite more typical these days because I have other colleagues in the MAT program that are actually in the same position as I am. We are uh, under restricted licenses and that, that enables us to, you know, teach temporarily for a year while we uh, finish up our MAT. So I think if an opportunity arises where you could do that, I would highly suggest doing it. If you're if you're fine with handling all the workload, of course, but I think it just gets you better prepared, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is the restricted license then if you're already one year into the MAT program or how is, how is that working? So actually I have a friend who is uh, has an M has a restricted license and he's only in year one of the MAT. Okay. But just yeah. generally speaking, you know, if you don't mind like if I mm -hmm. the restricted license is really open to anybody who has a bachelor's degree as long as you're planning to go on and get your teaching license. Mm -hmm. And the way that it works is exactly the way it works for Kevin. You, if you have a school or a district that's interested in hiring you, you make that arrangement with them and the paperwork that you sign says that you agree that you're going to get your get your license or your, or your your regular license, right? And then you go through the whole teacher standards and, uh, and uh, practices commission and they give you this temporary, it's a temporary license that you can teach on it for three years. How common is this? Um, increasingly common. Uh, but as Kevin said, it's it was pretty almost unheard of, right? Five, ten years ago, very uncommon. The teaching, as you know, there's lots of teaching opportunities right now, and there are more with the pandemic and people kind of shifting jobs and leaving and so on. So that teaching, the need for teachers is really great, and there are actually it's actually very possible to teach now with your restricted bachelor's degree as long as that's something you're thinking about pursuing. Yeah. 
think a lot on the coast because like when they were doing I was when I was originally in the satellite education program over there, they were pretty much handing out emergency license. And that wasn't just only to me, that was also I worked in Title One. There was a bunch of EA so I was doing different programs and they were offered to have emergency licenses to fill positions. Uh, I guess I guess this is kind of like a really broad question, but if anyone in the room can answer it, like as far as it goes like state to state, like is this like something that's specific that's happening in Oregon or is it like more of a general sort of like country wide experience? This is a very national experience right now. I got my teaching license on an emergency license in two thousand and three, so a long, long, long time ago. And I think that um I think the way that it happens here is way better than like my experience because there is so much opportunity for mentorship, right? And so like um Kevin, I'm sure you can speak to this, but like hopefully you have some mentors out south and then you have methods and Margaret and you have um other folks in the MAT. But I think if there's like wraparound support for you in doing that, then it's um the potential for it is strong, but it also can be really uh tricky. Yeah, I'll just say it is different around the country because I got certified in Connecticut. You did not have to have a master. You did not. You just go to a certification full on time. If you have an elementary school certification back at the college I went to, had a high school certification program, and you didn't have to have your master's. They expected you to get your master's, but you didn't have to. Actually, the Oregon law has just changed so that you don't need a master's degree in Oregon. It's not widely known, but you don't actually need it. They do hope that you're going to get it and you need a certain number of graduate credits. But And that's part of the reason for that. The easing of the restrictions is because the need is so high. So I'm a little bit ambivalent about, right, about, about that because I think you want to be prepared. You want to feel confident when you go in. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what Mary Lynn was saying about the kind okay. of support you're getting. I have something to add with that though. It's super expensive to live in Hawaii, but they are desperate right now. They've just way up their um, their uh, teacher salaries, and they just preference to male teachers. And then before Kevin jumps in, I mean, this was like so. You said this was a long time ago oh, when yeah, you yeah. got a degree, and I'm and I was gonna say back in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, I'm from the LA area, and so you could get an emergency uh, teaching credential. And but the but the the horrible thing, uh, because LA was paying really great um, salaries um, at at the time because there there weren't enough teachers. The the problem with that though is this preparedness that I hope that you can talk about, Kevin, and and the wraparound. Um, portion um and in our area we were in need of people that were bilingual but there were no bilingual materials for kids so like those those same teachers that were being you know like hired on the spot didn't have any pedagogy preparation they were the ones that were sort of making up materials on the fly which is great because they were servicing someone but they didn't have like any of the background for that and so I can say that I, I feel like through the late 80s and 90s, Los Angeles had so many people that were really unprepared to actually have classroom experiences that I think had adverse effects and then shifted who got an emergency credential or not. Uh, so, so, so it can be a bad thing, I think, you know, but I think when we have, we're living in a moment of a pandemic where we can't even find substitutes, right? Um, Anyway, so I hope you can. And again, I'm going to veer in here before you pick this up. But yeah, it, the, and when you say it can be a bad thing, I think the thing that you want to think about when you're thinking about if I wanted to teach, would this be the route I wanted to go, is exactly what you're saying that without that support, the people who get these emergency licenses without the support, the statistics are really um, clear that they burn out fast and they're the people who tend to leave. So that's why you want to think about it ahead of time. I guess there's somebody who has to talk about that, right? But, uh, but yeah, it will be. I'd like to know, and I keep asking you, like, okay, are you getting enough support? Is, you know, is your so talk a little bit about that. Okay, so at South, um, as a, when I got hired, um, I spoke with the principal, and he informed me that I will get a mentor teacher who will work with me, um, over the year to assist me with like lesson planning and any other questions I may have, and also I'm working with an instructional coach as well, who kind of observes my classes, uh, takes notes, 
and then meets with me afterwards to kind of talk to me about like all right, what went well, what didn't go well, what could you do better. So I'm um, actually uh, my instructional coach dropped by yesterday, and actually just out of, out of the blue <laughs> came into my classroom, kind of panicked. <laughs> she was like, oh, don't worry, I'm just gonna sit here and fill a notebook and I was taking notes. But afterwards, I really learned a lot about what I could be doing better, and so that was really informative. And so for me, I feel like I am getting support, which is nice because. I was worried when I took up the position. So I was like, what am I gonna do? Like, I mean, I've been learning a lot, you know, for sure at the in the MAT program, like instructional strategies and like educational theory and stuff like that. But I think that real teaching happens in the classroom. And if uh, you learn the most when you're actually doing it. So that's just my observation. Uh, so in, I guess, in your experience, like, what kind of things did you do that prepared you the best for, like, teaching, just in general? You know, it could be, like, English program or books you've read or just, you know, really broadly, the best you can answer, you know? Well, that's prepared me. Um, so, <laughs> are, are you being prepared uh, right now for uh, the yeah, program? Yeah. Okay. You know? yeah, for sure. I'm, be I'm being prepared for sure uh, in the program. But I feel like teaching is a lot of people skills. And I feel like as long as you really have that, then I think you will do well in the profession because a lot of it is patience and dealing with children. So if you have the capacity to do that and, you know, not, you know, I guess, how do I put it? Like, if you're fine with doing it and you can do it well, I think you'll be fine in teaching because not, not everyone, I think, can work with kids. It's just a very specific kind of trait, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, so as long as you have that, you'd be fine. And that will be great for sure. Yeah, so kind of relating that question, maybe narrowing it down a little bit for you. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific courses that you can think of from uh, your bachelor's that specifically helped you with teaching? Maybe it's like a grammar course mm -hmm. or a specific English class that you always think back to to help you? Okay. I certainly think back to the young adult model class with Dr. Perot. That really helped me because it kind of taught me how to teach novels. So mm -hmm. that was really that was really good and then i remember taking an advanced grammar class with dr Fetisella as well so that really got me thinking into like grammar and how to teach it well and stuff like that and of course taking literature courses will help you prepare teaching literature mm -hmm. so like all the courses i took with dr alvarez and also um dr maltz really helped me a lot with um understanding novels and lit theory and how to really like teach that to people so awesome. yeah thank you I haven't really considered teaching at all until this term. Um, my dad's a teacher, so I spent a lot of time in a kindergarten classroom and around like middle schoolers, but I think I really did interest in teaching high school. What, was it hard for you to go from being really immersed in college level academics and English and like enjoying that and then going to teaching high school level English? Like, I don't know if that's clear. But. Also, like, how was the experience of like being a, a, a an English major student compared, how does it compare to like teaching it? Uh, yeah, kind of. So what I'm worried I would be challenged by is that I love um, college level academic English so mm -hmm. much that going into teaching high school might be disappointing almost mm -hmm. to have to like regress to that level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. Let's see. For sure in terms of like level of like literature that you're working with, I would say that unless you're teaching AP classes, like the TEFL AP Lit or AP Language Composition, you'd be working with like lower level um, books for sure. And then in terms of things you're teaching, um, you know, you're, you'll, you'll be teaching writing and all that, but the expectation isn't like college level, but it's quite, it depends on like the grade level, if it's a freshman class, sophomore. But if you're teaching, uh, if you're teaching like seniors, then it would be pretty close to college level. So I think it just depends on which um, grade level specifically you're working with. So for you um, specifically, mm -hmm. was that a difficult transition to me? Okay. Um, I mean, I still love literature in general. So even if I'm teaching like lower level in terms of like difficulty, I still enjoy it because it's still, you know, things that I love reading and I'm teaching them how to write well. So those things are things that I enjoy. So even if they're not like super challenging where I'm, I feel like I'm growing. I'm still growing in a way, but in a different level. I'm just learning how to 
help students really learn and appreciate, you know, how to get better in a way. I don't know if that, that's making sense, but it's just the process of helping them is also helping me grow. Kind of related to that. Um, when you get like essays from your students or whatever, like, is it hard to not hold them to a higher standard? Is it like, <laughs> have you ever read something you're like, yeah. wow, how did they, <laughs> like, this is the worst thing I've ever read in my life? <laughs> like, how do you grade that? How do you give them constructive oh, feedback yeah. where you're not ripping it apart with a red pen? Just, so, <laughs> I remember like, when I was a student here, um, I had Dr. Maltz, and I love Dr. Maltz, but I feel like she's a really strict writer. <laughs> and I learned a lot. My, my writing improved uh, immensely. But I remember like struggling in that class and all my papers being like C, Bs. I've never, I've never gotten an A. <laughs> okay. hey, <what> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, but then, yeah, like as I'm reading my students' papers now, I'm just, you know, it, it can be disappointing for sure, you know, seeing that, you know, how will they, how will they perform in college if they do decide to come, you know, go to college and transition? Um, it is disappointing, but you, know, you also have to think about that, you know, their high school. So you got to show them a little more grace, I, could, I guess, um, and just be more, I guess, forgiving in a way. But then also understand that they're there to learn and you're there to teach. So um, don't lower your standards too much. That's just what I'm, that's what I've been telling myself. Like, you know, just, I should not let everything slide. You have to, you know, help hold them accountable for their writing. And so I have a rubric in place where, you know, I tell them that you gotta watch, read it and then ensure that you're following it properly if you want to get the appropriate grade. And so far, when my students actually do read the rubric and follow through, <laughs> then they actually are capable of producing quality work. And so it's just um, setting the expectations and really getting the kids to understand that, all right, like, you know, we're here to improve. And so I expect a lot, I'm not, I mean, I expect things like great things from you and I know you're capable of doing. So it's just a lot of like encouragement and all that. So, okay. yeah. but you'd be surprised. A lot of my kids actually are capable of producing almost college level work. Yeah, so it's just, um, a matter of bringing it out into the surface and really helping them find their writing, like their like writer self. So kind of like uh, going off that degree, like uh, I'm curious. Uh, this probably varies from person to person, but like what kind of uh, thing do you like in teaching English to students? Like what do you find to be the most difficult thing to impart? Like grammar, you know, like it could be even spelling. I know that's not as much of an issue with like spell checker and stuff, uh, but like you know, writing and everything. I was just wondering, you know, as a teacher yourself, is there anything that's been a source of frustration? Okay, it's just um, not seeing the same passion and fervor that I have for the subject material because not all students in your class will love English or reading. A lot of my kids hate reading, they come in like, oh, I gotta read again. <laughs> so, like, we're reading Catcher in the Rye right now. And a lot of my kids are like, oh, this book's so boring. <laughs> but, you know, and I'm like, it's not that bad, but it's just, you know, it's just getting them to, I guess, share that passion with you. And it takes a lot of work, really, like converting non readers to readers or like non literature lovers to literature lovers. So it's, I would say, trying to bridge that gap would be the toughest one, but it's also the most rewarding because as, as, as soon as you can pull kids into the world of literature, then they will, I would say that, you know, the world is their oyster. They could just grow from there on, from then on. So, yeah. Do you feel yeah. like you've been able to do that to convert students, as you say? Oh, it's only been my fifth or yeah. <laughs> sixth week teaching. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but like my overseas experience, I would say that. Sorry, Ken. Oh, no worries. <laughs> but I'm um, answering your question. Uh, when I was overseas, um, a lot of my students didn't really like English or didn't really have an exposure to it. But when I showed them that you know, you know, it's possible to you know feel connected to it, I showed them like media, like I don't know, shows, movies, music that they already typically enjoy. And I just showed them that, you know, 
if you can connect yourself to those things, then you know you could. They actually did eventually fall in love with with this. So it's just a matter of making those connections. Mm -hmm. That's only the end of your first fall term, and you jumped in in the middle, so that's a pretty <laughs> profound statement. Yeah. Thanks, but Kevin. I think we can, we can actually take you off the spot. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great yeah. job. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Carrie, the team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Oh, my dad came and changed it for us. <laughs> well, thanks you all. So let me introduce them briefly and let's let them get their little their first feel. So we've got Teresa Connolly who teaches at Grants Pass High School. She teaches our advanced Southern credit classes, which are dual credit classes for SOU credits for high school students. And we're delighted that she's here. We have Hannah Cronin, who graduated from the MAC program just last year. Now teaches at Grants Pass High School. And we have John Kellogg, who we haven't seen for ages, but you might recognize him. If you go to the Moodle Link site, as the guy in the front Flintstone suit who's jumping up in front of this classroom. So we're so glad that you all are here. And if you could just take three or four minutes to just talk a little bit about what you do now and how you got to where you are, and maybe we've got some more questions for you folks. Just start with I was just going to say that was foreshadowing because John is a, an official caveman now. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be, but. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right, well, obviously, I'm the old lady in the room. And I have been at Grand Spouse High School since, well, probably before you were born. 1989 is when I first started. So, obviously, I'm very pleased with my job. I've always, always wanted to be a teacher. I just, my earliest memories and the games I played always involved creating little school rooms where I wasn't the student, I was the teacher. So my friends always had to be the students. Yes. <laughs> and I remember so vividly um, my senior year in high school, all the counselors saying, we have a surplus of teachers in Oregon. You're not going to have a job. There are so many teachers without jobs. And then I just felt so at ends, right? Like my dream wasn't um, meant to be. So I took another path for a while. and. How can I do this for the rest of my life? I just, oh, this is sad. I want to be a teacher, whether there's a surplus or not. And so then I um, went to University of Oregon and received, obviously, my English degree and the endorsement in English. And I decided while I was there, they're doing some exciting things with special education. I think that actually is what probably got me the job, first of all, in uh, the high school. Um, because that dual endorsement just sort of helped them fill some holes. It's like, well, we have enough English teachers, but maybe we could use you for two periods, but we could use you for four periods doing special education. And then slowly as uh, people retired, right, I just moved more into that department. But the dual endorsement was a smart way to go uh, for me. I think there's such a shortage of teachers right now that this would be the worry about that. And uh, I've loved every day of teaching. And I could have retired two years ago. And I just don't want to because I still love it. And it still fills me with purpose and energy. And it is exhausting for sure. But it is the most amazing uh, part of my day, really. I love it. Um, I had the pleasure, Teresa was my English teacher when I was in high school, um, and honestly, Teresa is what made me want to be a teacher, um, and then in my student teaching experience, Teresa was my CT, which was very exciting, and now we teach at the same school, which is crazy, she's right across the hall from me, it's very nice, every day I'm like, hey, I need your help, help me out, um, um, but I always tell people I've been in school my entire life. I've never left school because I love school. I love education. I love learning. Um, right now I teach a freshman essentials class. So my students are pretty much all in special education. I love them. They're so goofy. They're so silly. They always have the weirdest things to tell you. It's so great. Um, and then I teach a sophomore English. And I love every minute of my job. I always tell my kids, I'm like, oh, I like not even being at school like it's not a job I love being here um, 
like Teresa, I look forward to going to work every day. Um, I definitely know I'm in the right career. And I'm, yeah, Thanks, Hannah. Howdy, everyone. My name is John. Uh, I also work at Grand Spouse High School. Uh, this is my third year of teaching. Uh, every single year has been a little bit crazy. Uh, but when it comes to crazy, I think that that uh, describes a lot of teachers. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I, I think that uh, teaching at Grand Spouse High School has just been such an amazing experience. And one of the reasons I like it so much is because every single day I get to do something different. Uh, and I enjoy so much working with kids. Uh, as an English teacher, I teach freshmen, juniors, but I also get to teach leadership, uh, which is we run our assemblies, the dances, all of the fun uh, events that we have in school. And it's kind of crazy just how much you can do in one day and just have everything kind of go by and just still have fun no matter what you're doing. I feel like teaching is one of those things where you might not know, always know what's coming, but you always know that at the end of the day, you're going to feel like you accomplished something, you got something done, even on the hard days. Uh, teaching in Grand Spouse and being an English teacher has been awesome. Uh, I feel as though, uh, it's kind of my journey, uh, I started off by going to Oregon State University and uh, wasn't my favorite college, to be honest. Uh, a lot of the English classes were filled with 60, 70 students, and I didn't get to experience a lot of the one on one teaching. Uh, and then I finished off my degree here at Southern Oregon University. Uh, ended up taking five years for me to get my bachelor's just due to that transfer. Uh, and then I finished the MAT program here. And holy moly, I, I love this school so much. And I feel like SOU has been able to really honestly prepare me for being a teacher. Uh, so I feel as though teaching, if you guys are thinking about it, which I hope you are if you're here, uh, is something that you guys should absolutely do. If you're ever worried about like, uh, having a job where things get boring, teaching is not uh, Every single day will be something different. And I honestly think that uh, I've never had a day where it's felt as though I've made the wrong choice to be a teacher, even if it's a bad day. It's been yes. honestly awesome. Well said. Well said. All, all of you, thank you so much yeah, for coming out of the explosion of the tire. <laughs> <laughs> Just part of our story. Right? We're always making stuff. Now, what you missed was some really awesome questions from this from this group, and that was great. I wonder if you have more questions that you'd like to fire away at any of these. Um, um, I, was, I was talking about sport. I haven't considered going into teaching until very, very recently. Um, I'm going to graduate with my English degree, but would you recommend like a certain pathway to get me more familiar with the potential of teaching before I go into my job community? I know Cynthia for a gal that was retired. And for two years, she uh, worked with our ABICS program. Mm -hmm. And it is a sort of a whole learning system, but she just got into the classroom working with students, but she wasn't teaching per se, coming up with lessons, she wasn't there all day. But she would come for like maybe two or three hours, two days a week, and just get used to being around high school kids and and the dynamics of that. And then, as she did that, she, it just sort of affirmed for her that she wanted to be part of that energy. I think it's super important to even sometimes just say, make a connection. Can I come to Grand South High School one day and uh, observe you three? We would all say yes. It's just getting out there and and just seeing the energy and I think you'll know. And she means that that's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I think I would love to pick you up on that. <laughs> Actually, field <laughs> trip. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's fun. All right, if I could jump in real quick too. Um, I think an option too is uh, doing some overseas teaching, even just for one year. Um, because I think being able to like travel abroad and also teach at the same time will just really open up your perspective and the way you see things. And so actually teaching overseas actually helped me really realize my passion for teaching as well. So if you could do that, even for a year, that would help a lot. How did you go about it? Like, because I'm really interested in teaching abroad. Like, what? Is there a specific program you get into? Like how, yeah. what are the requirements? What does that look like? So it really depends and varies on what program we're planning to get into. In my case, I work with EPIC. It's a program in South Korea called English Program in Korea. And it's a, gover it's a government uh, run program where you would apply and then the government will basically choose uh, a placement school for you depending on where they need 
English teachers because it's kind of like a lottery system. So I got placed in a pretty rural village and I thought that was actually really neat because no one really spoke English and being like the only foreigner there really um, uh, made people realize that, oh wow, like this is a big world and English is actually a skill that could benefit me. And so I actually taught adults as well. I, I taught like a evening adult class uh, twice a week. So that was actually really uh, fun too because I, I would have like 60 year old, 70 year olds learning English. And so it's just the, the dynamic is totally uh, interesting and different. So, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot you mentioned, was that right after you got your bachelor's before mm -hmm. the MAC program? Okay. Yeah. There's a program from I3, like if you look at the study away, like if you wanted to do it as like a study abroad internship type thing, you can get scholarships that way. Like um, the partnership with Oregon State, they have a ton of people opportunities to go into research. So it's different variety of countries. Keep your eye on the email list to come out on Monday. That's what there's an opportunity for the one right now with France if you're interested. You don't have to be a full French speaker, but that's a French position. Actually, I love that you brought up uh, TESOL. I kind of forgot to mention that, but when I graduated with my bachelor's, I actually did take a TESOL program. It was online for about like 120 hours. You get a diploma. Basically, they teach you how to teach English as a foreign language, which is completely different from teaching English to like native speakers. So that program really helps prepare you in terms of how to approach pedagogy with like uh, non-native English speakers. And so. It's like ESL, but a little different. There's um, scholarships on SOFA too for people with certificates. It doesn't have to be through SOVA, it can be if they're like external scholarships for them. Especially for our impact people. Yeah, I mean, I kind of asked this question already, but I wanted to ask like, what was like, what is like a really difficult concept for you guys to approach to students? And I don't know, like if there's some sort of story you may tackle it or, you know, kind of a broad question, but, you know, I figured it's interesting. <laughs> uh, one thing my freshmen have really struggled with um, is anything abstract for figurative language. So personification is like the hardest thing for them to understand. Um, so one thing I went over to Teresa and I was like, Teresa, help me. I don't know what to do. They can't, they don't get it. Um, so, I, the way I do stuff, we like define it, we come up with goofy examples, and then one day I just had them like give me a random object and then like something a person does, and they were like very excited to match those up, like a chair, walking, what? They were just over the moon, they were like, that's insane. Um, but they still weren't getting it, like they weren't able to produce it on their own, like in their own writing. Um, so one thing Teresa suggested is that we were reading the house on Mango Street at the time that we go through and they like highlight on their own like, oh, now I can identify it. Maybe I can use that as a model to write my own. It's gotten a little bit better. <laughs> we're still working on it. Uh, you think they get something and then the next day they're like, what? We I've never heard that word before. Um, so you just got to really be persistent True. and keep practicing. Yeah. Um, so just try different things, ask people, I am asking Teresa all the time to help me out with stuff like that. That's kind of what I have said. What, is, what about you, John? Uh, I think the writing process itself is kind of one of those things I work on a lot with my freshmen because I can ask them tons of fun creative questions, but actually teaching them the tools to be able to answer a question well and make sure that they write even if they don't know an answer to make sure that they have some sort of a response on the page. Uh, a lot of my freshmen, they get to the point where if they see a question and then they just say, well, I don't have a good enough answer, they'll just put down their pencil and not write the thing. And so trying to teach them how to make sure that they put something on the paper, even if they might not know an answer or try and actually attempt has been probably the biggest thing. And uh, apathy when it comes to turning in assignments that are half to even 99% of the way done uh, and getting those things turned in. So just kind of working on those tools. Thank you. Um, I was going to say one thing I have found very helpful, whether I'm working with uh, students that we would say are essential students or students that we would identify as advanced, as uh, using templates. And so even creating, let's say, a claim for a paper, and maybe I get part of the language going for them that they're filling in, you know, like Ray Bradbury explores um, happiness. 
and suggest that. And then, you know, like they just have to finish that. And then they start to discover that very simple template leads them to their claim. And then once they start working on that, then they can start playing around with their own language and phrasing. But sometimes, you're right, it's getting it down on the paper and they're so afraid it's gonna be wrong. But templates, I swear, they're just way to go. If I teach summer school, I use templates and I slowly <laughs> back them away and back them away and make them internalized. And I just, I'm a firm believer in that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, have you only ever taught like a small class or is it like do you do blocks and not not people wise, oh, yeah. just <laughs> time wise? Like mm -hmm. I don't know how Grand Staff works. I don't know if it's the seven periods a day every day or if it's blocks. So have you taught both? Which ones do you like? Which ones do you not like? Our schedule changes every single day. <laughs> um, the kids often complain that Grand Staff just need to pick one schedule. Because um, they go to different periods every single day. So we have six periods a day, five periods a day. We six, teach five, six. but they have six. Yeah, they have, they have six. six classes they attend a day, but I'll only see out of five days them four days out of the five. Um, and sometimes the periods are in different orders, but there are 61 minutes. Um, yeah, so it's a big 61. I wanted minutes. a specific time. We're running out in 2013. Yeah. 61 minutes. 14. Yeah, exactly. 314. We start at 753. But yeah, so they, some days um, we don't see them, or like if we have a three day week, like last week, it's like totally confusing and the kids come to the wrong class all the time. Today we had second period first, and so some of my first period kids came to second period, and they were like, "What? Where do I go?" I'm like, go to second period. Um, <laughs> very confusing for them. No. Also confusing for us. So yeah. Sixty-one minutes. <laughs> Many of you talked about the hard days, the the difficult days. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with the folks here what you're referencing and also like what you do to combat or take care of yourself during those hard days. I, just, I think inherently <laughs> high schoolers can just be mean without realizing it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, so inside of my uh, school desk drawer, every single time a student has ever written me a note that says like, thank you or hey, thanks for what you do, Mr. Kellogg. I keep every single one of those inside of a drawer so that if I have like a terrible day, I can go through and look at those, like pat myself on the back and say, it's okay. <laughs> but um, just kind of being aware that if you have a bad day, it is just a bad day. And then I think that teaching is kind of deceptively a very um, uh, lonely kind of position. You have to make sure that you're going out and talking to other people. You can't just expect your colleagues to come and talk to you. So especially when it comes to teaching, you need to remember that your support group is out there, but you need to go out and get it. You need to make sure that you go and talk to the other people that are there for you. Because I've seen a lot of teachers that when they do have those bad days, they shut themselves in the room, they don't go talk to anyone. And that is where it can sometimes become a little bit too internalized. So just making sure you check yourself and stay on top of that is really important. There is a vulnerability every day when you're in front of those kids. And when you try so hard, and you think you're so organized and it's so going to be perfect. And it doesn't matter how many years you've taught. It's just you hit these moments that aren't. And it feels like it's just kind of shocking still after all these years. Like, and then you internalize that. And I and I always start to think, what did I do wrong? How can I replay this? So there's always this going on. Yeah. Now on a good day, you do the same thing too, right? <laughs> like you're like, what was so good about today? What, what made this right and that moment wrong? And sometimes it's just the way it goes. It's an odd chemistry. Kid has a bad day. Sometimes it's like you just have to say, oh, don't think too much. Or put your filter on. Or I have been talked to you like that disrespectfully. Like, Why are you talking to me like that? And then they're like, I didn't mean to. Right? Usually when you talk about it, it works out. But sometimes it just is a crummy day or a crummy moment and you shade it for the whole day. 
obviously we tend to exaggerate we're a little bit more emotional. <laughs> so it could have been two minutes a third period and all of a sudden that's all you go home thinking about are those two minutes instead of first was great and second so always have to put things in perspective and try to let them go that's super hard i'm not good at that but um, kind of like what John said, the kids this year, they haven't been in school for a while, so they kind of don't really know what boundaries are. Um, so sometimes they're mean to you, sometimes they're mean to other kids, and you have to be like, hey, like, we're all friends here. If we're not going to be friends, let's at least be communal in our space. Um, so the kids definitely sometimes are just kind of feeling feisty. Um, but it's, I try to remember that it's not their fault all the time that they also have stuff that they bring just like we have stuff from home that we bring to school and it's just how it is we're humans um and so definitely don't hold any grudges against those kids like the next day it's going to be a whole day and they maybe won't even remember what they said um <laughs> even in 10 minutes they're like yeah. oh my gosh i'm having the best day ever even though they were just like <laughs> screaming at you the crazy ones. <laughs> <laughs> they are kind of crazy sometimes um, or I have this one very specific situation. Um, when I read out loud, if I fumble over a word and a student will correct me, <laughs> I'm like, calm down. I know like, we all make mistakes. Read out loud can be hard sometimes. So trying to model, like, <laughs> it's okay to make a mistake. Like we'll get through it. It's fine. Uh, but like John was saying, definitely find your support system. Sometimes I go to Teresa and I just like cry. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Help. Um, and then she gives me a hug and I feel better. And I also <laughs> have little notes. I don't have them in my drawer. I actually post them next to my desk so I can just look at them and be like, oh, that student loves me. That I'm a good teacher. I'm, I'm doing a good job. Um, so definitely a support system and then little positive messages from like people that we work with and then also our students. Yeah, because sometimes it's even hard to tell your adult friends, like, wow, I really lost my temper or, or it didn't go well. Because then, you know, you're thinking, oh, they're going to think I'm so lame at this job and I should just keep it in my classroom. That's just one of the worst things to do. I just kind of wanted to generally ask about so the transition from remote learning to back in person. I was just curious, like, what kind of difficulties or successes you might have had in that kind of area? I mean, that could be for the professors, too. <laughs> really, really broad. The kids are carrying a lot of stress. And they're having a rough time. So like we may think at the beginning of school years, like let's reduce our scope and sequence knowing that last year was tough and we're already reducing what we reduced because we just realized like if you push them too fast, they just check out, they collapse or it's immediate, like everything's going well and then they'll just hit. There's no middle ground. Just hit high, and then you're just like, "Hey, what just happened? Like, it's okay. We'll figure it out." They don't seem to know how to navigate things and stress right now. I'm working on that a lot with my students, and um, I'm putting aside maybe, you know, two or three units that I think are so important to slow things down and talk about community and respect and how we navigate stress. How we organize. I've spent more time this year than I have in ages printing calendars for them, helping them write down due dates. Those little things that I haven't done for ages. But they just seem to be at all odds. They, they're not focusing when they read. Like uh, have them read focus reading longer than 20 minutes. It, it just doesn't happen. Their attention span is very short. So those are just things we're addressing all the time now. My kids are having a hard time communicating with each other because we've been yeah. isolated for a while. Um, so teaching them how to be kind to each other. And when we disagree, we don't scream at somebody. We go, oh, I see your opinion, but this is my opinion. Um, they really like typing. So kind of training them again to be like, okay, we're going to write and 
the computer isn't going to capitalize for us or use punctuation or put that squiggly line under it when you misspell something. Um, so kind of learning that, but definitely like the community and just kind of being in a space together that's shared. Like some of my classes are 30 kids and others are like eight. So um, that, and then I'm a part of a freshman team because I teach freshmen and we had a meeting Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday? One of the days we had a meeting. Don't be afraid. We really One day we had a meeting recently this week. Um, and a few freshmen came in and were expressing kind of like what their experience was and kind of like Teresa was touching on, the kids are really stressed out. And they were like, you know, I'm really anxious in class. Like it's too quiet or it's too loud. And I, I don't know what to do or I don't know how to self-regulation is really hard for them right now. Um, or even being like, oh, I see a person in this class, so I'm just going to hide in the bathroom because I don't want to be there. Um, so they're kind of uncomfortable. And um, one student was like, you know, I do my work and I just don't turn it in. And that's something we're seeing a lot of right now because they're used to like being able to hit that submit button online. Turning in a hard copy is really hard, even if you do it in class, like go walk over to the basket and put it in. And so they need those reminders. Um, but I'm just learning to have grace a lot. And I learned how to be a teacher on Zoom. So that's a little different also. So like learning to be a teacher in person is also kind of weird. Um, so grace for me and grace for them. <laughs> Definitely the best. Yeah, we had a pretty extreme learn how to be a teacher on Zoom with blank squares, right? Yeah, blank classes. squares. And then yeah. no faces, it was blank boxes. And it was they typed. <laughs> it was the class I taught with Teresa. Mm -hmm. They just typed all their answers. So your question is really, really apt. I would just say that what we're observing over at South is a lot of attendance issues for sure. Because I guess even coming to school is a struggle for them these days. They're just, they've, they've been so used to just being at home and you know learning online. And so we're just trying we're I'm part of an intervention group. Um at, we have small schools at South, so I'm part of like a little uh, group for my small school and we're trying to call up parents and trying to get people to come because some of them Attendance just spotty. Like one day they show up, the other day they won't. So just a lot of trying to get these to come. I think um, when it comes to freshmen, every student that had a bad home life has been stuck at home for 12 to 18 months. And so you have to think our homeless population, our population of students where it might seem like everything's fine, but they actually have an abusive parent that might not be on the record. There's there's a lot of trauma that has been kind of instigated and made worse over the past year that we're having to deal with inside of the classroom. Um, I've had to be cautious about certain questions I ask in class that might have traditionally been good, like creative answer questions that I've had to rephrase or change just to make sure I don't trigger certain students. Um, we have a quarantine process where if a student comes in contact with someone that has COVID, they might have to miss up to two weeks of school. And I have some students that have been quarantined up to two to three times. So out of the two, what is it, like three and a half months we've been in school, they've missed a month and a half or more. And so I've had to, last year when everything was online, I was just an online teacher. I had to teach them, do the best I could. But this year I'm supposed to be 100% the best I can be in person. But then also without any of the extra free time I had last year, make sure I'm teaching just as well for the students that missed six weeks completely online. So it's been double teaching without the extra time in order to make sure I'm doing my best. So I think a hard thing this year has just been making sure that I am serving those students that miss out on school because they might just have accidentally brushed up against someone that had COVID, even if they don't get it, they're out. Um, so it's been just another level of making sure I cover all of my bases because I don't want a student to arrive halfway through the year and then go, well, I've got nothing because you didn't try and help me. And it's just been kind of a struggle trying to make sure that all students are getting the right level of instruction and I'm not choosing favorites by focusing on those that are there in person rather than the ones that might be at home or absent. What are some of the questions that you've had to rephrase just to make sure not to trigger those students that we, might have had adverse family or home life? So with our freshmen, we started off this year with a uh, vignette unit. We taught the house on Mango Street. And inside of that uh, story, uh, we don't necessarily teach the entire book, but we use it as kind of a model in order to write vignettes. One of the vignettes is about, uh, uh, I titled it the My House Vignette. So you're just supposed to write about your home. And 
in that vignette, I asked them to uh, describe the house, uh, just basically entirely scenery, sensory detail. The second paragraph was, tell me how you feel about the house. And the third one was, give me a memory. And I had to get rid of the give me a memory one because so many students just do over the past year and all the things that have happened got so depressive and focused on having to write a memory about their house that I just took it out completely and said, okay, two paragraphs, write it that way. Um, and I had to realize that was happening as I had students having like breakdowns in the back thinking about memories that had happened. And so that was a big one that just sort of opened up my eyes to like the amount of trauma that I hit students this year. What do you do to mitigate those moments, like when you're getting really frustrated in class or the students getting frustrated and you don't want it to be disruptive or if they're having a meltdown? It's not like you can just walk away from the students, so how do you handle that? <laughs> I think I can get away with this because I'm older. <laughs> so I mean, if I was the end teacher, and I'm sure the ladies here won't find a different answer, I usually just um, write if someone's having a bad time, I just come and put my hand here and I say, Are you okay? Do you need to go to the bathroom? And, um, and you can always tell, right? And they've never once been like, Oh, they let me just do this. And sometimes I just do this. And then I say, You want to go sit in the hallway with your girlfriend? And check on him do the class and i can pop out there sometimes i give them something to hold when they're having an anxiety attack and i see the hoodies going up and the tears coming down and very rarely would i say go to the counseling center though i know i could because i think they feel comfortable with me enough that i can i can guide with them i just love on it and then sometimes I put little notes in their backpacks and they don't know it, which they probably sounds really creepy. <laughs> 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 I'll try to write a note like, I hope you think it's better, or, you know, I'm so sorry you're having a bad day. And then I just kind of like slip it in a pocket and they'll find it later. And um, little things like that. And then you have a friend for life there because once you have taken time to reach out and be very human and understanding with them, they are loyal forever even if they have another bad day they they know they're in a safe place that's so important to me so that's what i do i have heaven oh, oh, sorry. sorry no go ahead okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, speaking of a safe place um when i came in i really tried to like emphasize the idea that my classroom is a safe space for everyone and if you have any issues just bring it up with me and actually kids have been doing that I actually had a kid today on my last period, who just came up to me and said, I'm having a bad day today. They probably come snappy, you know, just like, I I want to apologize. And I'm like, well, thanks for letting me know. If you need time, you can step out in the hallway and just take your time to calm down. And he told me, like, thank you, I appreciate it. So I think just, you know, making it a point that your classroom is a safe space really makes kids feel safe. And like, if they have any concerns, they can just bring it up to you. And actually that act of bringing it up to you if they're comfortable enough to do that, then I think that you know you're doing a good job of you know reaching out to them. So, yeah. oh, I have a little spot in my classroom next to my bookshelf that's like the little lounge area. I've got like some floor pillows, and if the kids like having a rough time, they know they can just go like sit over on a comfy pillow and like calm down and take a breather for a while. I have a few students um, that will just be like, "Miss Grant, I really got to go take a lap." And they'll go just like walk around the school and come back and they're cool. Um, sometimes I'll just say, hey, you want to go grab a drink of water real quick? You're a little frustrated. Um, I don't tell them that they're frustrated. Do <laughs> you want to go get a drink? And they're always like, yeah, I want to leave the room. Um, I also have a sticker wall in my class because the kids love water bottle stickers. And I also love water bottle stickers. And so sometimes I'll just put a little sticky note on their desk that says, go grab a sticker off the wall. And then they are like, oh, I get a little treat. I can like go pick out a sticker and then I can come back. Um, as far as if I'm having a bad day, <laughs> um, I, my freshmen are quite challenging this year, um, especially if they have some period freshmen. <laughs> they're like done at the end of the day. And my essential students, they're with each other all day because they have most of the same essential classes. So by the time they're in my seventh period, they just want to rip each other apart. They're tired of seeing each other. Um, so, so it's hard sometimes, like you're the adult, you're the regulator, um, to be like, okay, 
the kids are being kind of crazy. I need to take a breather. They need to take a breather. Um, so one day I just like, my class was insane. There was like arguments going on before the bell had even rung. <laughs> I was just like, yeah. you are all crazy. What's going on? It's a rough start. <laughs> before the bell even rings. Um, and so I kind of scrapped what I was doing that day and I was like, we're going to have a journal. We're all just going to sit and write about what it means to be nice to somebody and how we feel when people aren't nice to us. And then I did that journal too. It made me feel way better. They had 10 minutes where they could just sit and like get out all their crap that they were fighting about with each other in my classroom. Um, and that seriously helped and it has really changed the mood of that classroom. That class is like one of my favorite classes now because they know that if they're having a bad day, they can just like write it down and then forget about it. That's kind of what I've done. It's helped me too. If I'm having a bad day, I go, you know what? We're going to write instead of reading today. And they don't really care. They're like, okay, we'll write. They've started to enjoy it. So that's what I do. Uh, my first year of teaching, I didn't do something that I've done every other year that's helped me a lot. And if you make sure that you start off your class by doing like a really brief information sheet that asks students, if you're stressed, what would you like me to do in order to help you? I keep all of those on file just so that that way when I forget, because it inevitably happens, I can go through and make sure that I'm not doing something that they don't like to. Because I've had a few times, and I think maybe it's just because I'm a big guy with a beard, but if I walk up and I start doing that to someone, <laughs> they do have a different reaction. So uh, a lot of the times I just try and make sure that I'm doing what they want to. And then I think the other piece of advice I have is just make sure that you're being you. I think there's a real, yeah. it depends on the teacher, but you don't always want to be you depending on the teacher, but I think it's important to make sure that you realize uh, if you lie about who you are to the students, they're going to know right away and then they will not trust you. You cannot gain their trust back from them if you lie about who you are as a person. So the sooner you try and figure that out, how you want to run your classroom, I think it really just helps you so that that way the kids always know who you will be every single day. Because if you flip flop between you're authoritative one day, you're not the next they realize that and then they realize that they can't be themselves around you because they don't know what teacher you're going to be yeah. each day so i think that's a really important thing they watch they yeah watch all the time. like so it's kind of like you know we're getting close to time but i really want to ask this question because like bring up like relations it's all relational and like you create this bond with your students and like being your true self as a teacher but like in those chaos moments how do you establish boundaries like i've coached like boys before and like and like how do you like establish boundaries and authority but also being someone they can come to I guess it's a very difficult I don't know, process um gotten really good at the eyebrow raise <laughs> uh, because they can't see your face they can't see if I'm like smiling or like kind of scowling at them to knock it off um, I like to think that I'm a pretty welcoming person. Um, <laughs> people who know me and are like, yeah, great. Um, so I'm pretty goofy in class, um, and I'm not that much older than my kids, <laughs> so that is um, kind of hard sometimes when you're like trying to be the adult, but they're like, ah, you talk like us, you listen to the same music. Um, so just in those moments where you have to be really serious, getting really serious and being like, you know, you can't do that. At the beginning, definitely establishing a routine. My routine has really been helpful. Um, the kids know when they walk into class, they have to go to their file and grab their supplies. And we do the same routine every day. We start with 10 minutes of reading or writing, or we do a 10 minute meditation every day. And then we move to grammar and then we get out our books and we do that. So the routine kind of helps prevent any boundaries that may get push or if a boundary does get pushed I'm very like hey you know our rules we've all agreed we've all signed the rules we need to do this because we need everyone to be able to learn and if so and so is freaking out everyone else is paying attention to that and they're not going to be able to learn um, so kind of sticking to at the beginning of the year being like okay this is how things are ran and you've got to stick to that you can't flounder otherwise the kids are like oh we got them like we can get away with it so you have to be very like welcoming but also like when I'm serious I'm serious and we're not going to play around which is hard sometimes because I don't want to be like the mean teacher or like scowl at them because they're doing something crazy like they know that I love them and I want them to learn and they can't learn if they're going to be really nilly all the time 
I feel like if you just try your best to make sure that you know who they are depending on the chaos, because I think there's definitely very, very drastically different versions of chaos. If you have a student that's throwing chairs at you, maybe they'll throw a chair back. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you have a student that's just being defiant for defiance sake, I, I have some students where I know them well enough to where I can just call them out on what they're doing and be like, are you being serious right now? And they'll go, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. And then they'll, they'll back down. But you also need to make sure that uh, you're working with their counselors. If you have a student that has really, really high emotional problems, you need to make sure that you're talking to them, you know what they are. Uh, and then I don't have the best short-term memory, so I write down things everywhere. I try my best to make sure I'm putting down everything I can and make sure I, in my opinion, if you have a student that's just taking it too far, don't misunderstand the power of a phone call home. I've never had a student freak out the next day and go like berserk if I've talked to their parents and we've had a good conversation. I'm so impressed and grateful to you all for the range of answers that you've given to these really good questions. Um, they're yeah. so, your answers are so different, but yet create this kind of whole cohesive picture. This has been really been extremely interesting, and helpful and insightful. I wonder we have about three minutes left if you could each take maybe 30 seconds to any messages. I mean, we had sort of a sobering discussion based on Patrick's question, which was really useful and interesting, but maybe something positive, a message for the folks who are wondering about Teaching 30 seconds each. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to start, Joe? Yeah, sure. Uh, start a club, have fun, find a lesson that you really, really want to teach, teach it, do it again. Uh, do your best to make sure that you are teaching because you want to teach and not just because you want a job. Uh, try your best to make sure that you look at every single district out there and don't take a job just because they offer it to you. Look at their policies, make sure that you're not taking a job and then regretting it once you actually read the first policy that you take a look at. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, sorry, one second, not 30 seconds. Uh, I also brought copies of every local district's uh, certified salary schedule. So if you want to know what you might get paid as a teacher. Yeah, I printed 30, so. Thank you so much. Kevin, what's your message? Um, I would just say, you know, figure out the why as to why you want to be good. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing because, you know, as uh, they were talking about the bad days, if you can pull in that why and really understand, like, why you got into this position in the first place, why you wanted to enter this um, field, then it will just make everything easier. So, yeah, just find out that why. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you definitely have to love kids, not just your subject. Their secondary teachers were like, oh, we love our content area. We have to really love kids because that's who you're teaching. You're teaching the kids, not the book. I mean, you teach the book, but really, you got to <laughs> teach the kids. Um, and every day is just something new and exciting, and, and you never really know what's going to happen, which is why I really love it, and it's so fun. And um, I, I think it's the best job, but also the hardest job. Um, but if you do it, it's definitely worth it. I, I definitely agree. I just think you'll know. And and you just throw yourself a total abandon into the most craziest ride you could take in this life. And you accept you'll have good moments and bad moments. And like I always keep learning. Once I realized that a first year teacher really is not all that different from a teacher with 32 years, except facially. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but still, it's like just constantly learning and allowing yourself to evolve. It's a very exciting job. I love it. Thank you for that. Yeah, really different answers, a really nice cohesive picture. And I just want to say that what they all did tonight really exemplifies, I think, what it means to be a teacher. So for Kevin sitting here by himself and realizing I'm the only person <laughs> being on the spot, and then these three having a tire explosion and showing up and being able to be so caring and sharing and articulate. I mean, that's really what it's about, right? It's about, just, like you said, the things that come at you we don't expect. And that's both the challenge and the fun. So thank you all so very much. We are yes. so grateful. Of course. And we have, if you, for you all, if you want to choose a book from the back, 